We've already seen what the definitions of the referrals are, uh, but it's worth going back to concept statement four again just for a moment so that everyone understands what the definitions of the other elements of a statement of financial position are as well. Uh, assets are resources with present service capacity that the government presently controls. Liabilities are present obligations to sacrifice resources that the government has little or no discretion to avoid. Outflows of resources are consumptions of net assets by the government that are applicable to the reporting period. Uh, so you see the similarity between that and the definition of a deferred outflow of resources, which is also a consumption of net assets, but rather than being applicable to the reporting period, it's applicable to a future period. And likewise, inflows of resources or acquisitions of net assets by a government that are applicable to the reporting period, unlike deferred inflow, which are applicable to a future period. There are six pop outcomes, then, to the board's approach to analyzing these existing asset and liability balances. Uh, assets could continue to be reported as assets, or the board could determine they should be reported as deferred outflows or as current period outflows. And liabilities could either continue to be reported as liabilities or henceforth be reported as deferred inflows or current period inflows. Let's look at some examples from Statement 65. I'm not going to go through every item in there. That would be way too much. There is an appendix to this slide presentation that goes through each of the items that is listed in Statement 65 and the outcome of that analysis, whether they continue to be reported as assets and liabilities or are reported going forward as deferrals or inflows or outflows of the current period. The first example uh, is imposed non-exchange revenue. So what we're essentially talking about for the most part here is property taxes, although it also includes things like fines and penalties. Um, a government should report uh, an inflow related to property taxes as a deferred inflow of resources if the resources are received or recognized as receivable before the period for which the taxes are levied. So uh, here's an example. Let's say a government has a July 1 fiscal year, but it establishes its levy in May, the, the May preceding that July 1 fiscal year start. Uh, and that uh, levy at that point uh, is uh, legally enforceable government has a claim to those property taxes, it can report a receivable, but it's not going to report property tax revenue if inflows start to come in prior to the beginning of the following fiscal year. Anything that comes in related to that property tax levy for the next year will be reported as a deferred inflow because it's not related to the current period, it's related to a future period. And then when July 1 arrives, at that point, the government can those inflows as property tax revenues and eliminate the deferred inflow that it had recorded. Here are two other types of non-exchange transactions, government mandated non-exchange transactions and voluntary non-exchange transactions. What we're essentially talking about here are intergovernmental grants. And Statement 65 covers both sides of the transaction because governments may be both providers of grants and recipients of grants. So if resources are received or provided uh, in one of these non-exchange transactions in advance of one of the eligibility requirements being met other than time requirements, then the provider should be reporting an asset and the recipient reporting a liability. So let's look at an example of this. Uh, let's say uh, a government, the state government provides a grant to a school district uh, for uh, special education services. And in order to be eligible for that grant, the district needs to establish some kind of special education uh, program. So until that school district has established that special education program, it's going to report that inflow of resources it, it, it received the cash, so cash is debited, but it's also going to credit a liability, which it may call grant received in advance, uh, something like that. Uh, and the provider, the state, is going to you know, show a uh, credit to its cash, because the cash went out the door, but it's also going to debit an asset that may be called 
grants provided in advance until that eligibility requirement has been met. And so when the school district does establish that program and become eligible, at that point, it recognizes revenue. The provider, the state, will recognize an expense or an expenditure, uh, depending upon what financial statements you're looking at, uh, and for inflow or deferred outflow, if you're looking at the recipient or the provider respectively, will then be uh, eliminated as a part of that uh, accounting entry. Now, if all of the eligibility requirements have been met, except for a time requirement, for instance, uh, uh, grant money is provided up front, but there's a condition that it not be used until two fiscal years from now. Uh, the provider of the grant will report a deferred outflow of resources, and the recipient will report a deferred inflow of resources. So the provider, cash goes out the door, credits cash, and it debits a deferred outflow. The recipient receives the cash, it debits cash, and it credits deferred inflows to offset it. So there's no net impact in either case on net position until that future period, that fiscal year two years from now, is reached. And at that point, the provider re reports an ex a grant expense or expenditure, the recipient reports grant revenue, and the deferrals are eliminated. Here's an example of an item reported traditionally in the statement of financial position that was not only not an asset or liability, it wasn't a deferral either. Debt issuance costs uh, up to this point have been recognized essentially as an asset and amortized over the maturity of the debt to which they're related. But in fact, those costs are related to the period in which the debt's issued. There are the cost of issuing the debt. There's no ongoing cost uh, that, uh, that they represent, uh, with the possible exception of prepaid uh, bond insurance costs. But other than prepaid bond insurance costs, which would be reported as an asset and then uh, recognized over the life of the insurance agreement, uh, debt issuance costs should be recognized as an outflow of resources, an expense or an expenditure, in the period in which they are incurred. Statement 65 amends GASB Statement 48 on sales of future revenues uh, and uh, receivables by saying that for sales of future revenues uh, to an entity outside of the government, uh, the government should report the proceeds it receives from that sale as a deferred outflow of resources, and then it will recognize that as revenue, uh, or, you know, as uh, over the life of agreement. Um, if it's an intra-entity transfer of future revenues, meaning something within the financial reporting entity, such as between the primary government and one of its component units, then the transferee government, the one that's receiving the transfer of future revenues, uh, should report the amount that it paid as a deferred outflow of resources that would be recognized as outflows over the duration of the sale agreement. And the transferor government, the one that is providing, the f transferring the future revenues to the other entity, it will report the amount it received from that other entity that's within the financial reporting entity as a deferred inflow of resources and then recognize revenue uh, over the duration of the sale agreement. Under GASB Statement 23, uh, gains and losses from refundings of outstanding debt uh, are reported as debits or credits uh, you know, in the uh, financial statements as assets or liabilities. Uh, statement 65 says that uh, losses should be reported as deferred outflows, gains on the refunding should be reported as deferred inflows, and then recognized as a part of interest expense uh, over either the, sh the shorter of the life of the old debt or the life of the new debt. Um, they should, however, be reported separately from the related bonds payable. They shouldn't be netted uh, or added to uh, the amount for the bonds payable, which should be reported, obviously, as a liability. The same applies if we're talking about uh, changes in the provisions of a lease yeah, effectively, this is the same thing as a refunding of debt, and so the loss should be reported as a deferred outflow, and the gain, uh, if there is one, reported as a deferred inflow, and then recognized 
as a component of interest expense on that lease over the shorter of either the life of the old lease agreement or the life of the new lease agreement. Entities that have rates that are uh, regulated by an external regulatory board, like uh, some public uh, utilities, public power uh, entities, um, often uh, apply what used to be GA uh, FASB Statement 71 uh, for regulatory reporting, uh, but what was brought into the GASB's standards through GASB Statement 62. Um, if a regulator imposes uh, refunds on such an entity, uh, those are reported as liabilities. They should continue to be reported as liabilities. Uh, however, uh, you know revenues that are generated by current rates uh, that are intended to recover costs that will be incurred in the future uh, should be uh, reported as deferred inflows uh, until that period in the future when the expenses are actually incurred. Uh, any gains or other reductions of uh, allowable costs that are uh, intended to reduce rates in future periods, those should be reported as deferred inflows until those periods as well. Um, to the extent that there are costs that are expected to be in, uh, recovered uh, through future rates that uh, have been approved by the regulatory board, uh, at present those are reported as regulatory assets. Uh, under GASB Statement 62, and after GASB Statement 65, they will continue to be reported as regulatory assets. As you know, in the governmental funds, which report under modified accrual and current financial resources, uh, revenues are recognized when they are not just measurable and collectible, but also when they're considered to be available, which means that they're collected during the period or soon enough after the end of the period uh, in order to be used to liquidate current period expenditures. Uh, if a, uh, an ad has been recorded, uh, you know, for instance, a receivable in a governmental fund financial statement, but the revenue is not considered available, meaning it wasn't collected during the fiscal year or uh, within the period of availability after the end of the fiscal year, then that portion is uh, rooted as a deferred inflow of resources until the revenue becomes available. So, for instance, let's say we're talking about a property tax levy of a million dollars and uh, the year and during the 60 days after the end of the fiscal year, which is the uh, stated in the, in the standards, the stated period of availability, the government collects $900,000 on that million dollar levy. Uh, and the other $100 is expected to be collectible, but hasn't been collected during that year or the 60 days after the year. And so it's not considered available. It will report $900,000 of property tax revenue. And the other $100,000 it will report as a deferred inflow of resources. And then when that amount is collected in the future and becomes available, uh, then at that point, it will be recorded as property tax revenue and the deferred inflow will be eliminated. As I said earlier, I'm not going to go through every single item that was dealt with in Statement 65. Those are covered fully in the appendix to these slides, uh, but it's worth mentioning a couple of uh, items that uh, are reported as assets and liabilities now and that will continue to be reported that way. For instance, uh, Prepayments, like prepaid rent or prepaid insurance, are reported as assets now. They should continue to be reported as assets in the future. Um, resources that have been advanced to another government uh, as part of a, you know, an intergovernmental grant, a, a government mandated or voluntary non-exchange transaction, uh, when the eligibility requirements, other than the time requirements, have been met, will continue to be reported uh, as an asset. We already mentioned that when we were talking about these types of transactions earlier. Items that should continue to be reported as a liability going forward include resources that are received in advance of an exchange transaction. So, you know, when there's actual exchange of value for value, for instance, uh, maybe the purchase of a, a, a municipal parking permit for the, f for the succeeding year. Uh, that would be reported by the government as a liability until 
it had actually earned the uh, the payment on that. It had actually you know gotten to the period where it was providing the uh, tax, uh, sorry, the parking service, uh, and at that point uh, it would recognize uh, revenue from the transaction and would eliminate the liability. Um, Something else that is affected by the reporting of deferrals is the uh, determination of what governmental and enterprise funds are required to be reported as major under GASB Statement 34 and therefore reported on the face of the financial statements in their own column. Statement 34, uh, a governmental fund, for instance, is required to be reported as major if the total of its assets, its liabilities, its revenues, or its expenditures are greater than or equal to 10% of the total for all funds of that category or type, and that same element is greater than or equal to 5% of the total for all governmental and enterprise funds combined. 65 does to the major fund determinations is essentially just add the deferred outflows to the assets and the deferred inflows to the liabilities. So uh, we just talked about governmental funds. Let's talk about an enterprise fund. If uh, the total of an enterprise fund's assets plus deferred outflows or liabilities plus deferred inflows or its revenues or its expenses is greater than or equal to 10% of that total for all the enterprise funds and uh, is greater than 5% of the total for all governmental and enterprise funds combined, then that fund is required to be reported as major. The last item in this presentation then is to talk about something that Statement 65 says about the use of the term deferred. The board said that should be limited to deferred inflows and deferred outflows of resources so that it's clear that if you see that there, that that is in fact uh, a deferred inflow or deferred outflow and not some other, uh, not an asset or a liability, even though there are some assets or liabilities right now include the term deferred in them. Uh, now there's something bigger underneath that and I think it is to make clear that as governments start to report these deferred outflows of resources and deferred inflows of resources, that they label them in a way in which it is clear to the user of the financial statements why these uh, are deferred outflows or deferred inflows, uh, you know, and, and not just sort of all of them lumped together, even though they're very different. For instance, uh, a, a deferred inflow of resources because, uh, you know, revenue isn't considered available under modified accrual is a very different type of inflow uh, from a deferred inflow from one that is reported because um, uh, you know a grant has been received in advance, uh, but it, it is uh, intended for a future period. Uh, you should be able to label those, or they should label them in a way that users would be able to distinguish them because they're different kinds of deferred inflows and they have different implications for the government and for its ability to uh, use those resources that it has received in order to operate the government. You know, if you were talking about assets, it certainly wouldn't be acceptable to just label a whole bunch of different kinds of assets, you know, receivables and uh, cash and investments and, uh, you know, bridges, buildings as just assets. Uh, they're very different. Uh, they have different characteristics and uh, users look at them differently, and so governments are required to report them as what they are, and they really should take the same approach to deferred outflows and deferred inflows of resources. And that brings us to the end of the presentation on deferrals. Uh, if you've done the readings and you've made it through uh, this interminable uh, 
presentation on deferrals. Uh, you should have a much better understanding of what they are and why they're reported and what statements 63 and 65 require. If you have any questions, of course, you can email them to me or post them on the course website uh, so that everyone can benefit from the answers, and I would obviously be very happy to answer them for you. Thank you very much for your attention.